Radio. Welcome everyone to 198.4 Fiction Radio, where we talk about all the fictional music you love from movies and TV. I'm your host, Sean Coney, and with me is sometimes my co-host, Dustin Weiskopf. Dustin, how you doing today? Howdy doody, Sean. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. We're about to talk about my favorite Adam Sandler movie, Airheads, and the fictional band, The Lone Rangers, which, by the way, I'm wearing a shirt for, if you can see this, huh? Oh, look at that. The Lone Rangers, 94, live in, pr- well, no spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't want don't, to don't spoil it too soon here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. You came dressed for the occasion. Uh, so what makes this film so special in your life? It's hard to articulate Uh, why this is my favorite Adam Sandler movie outside of the fact that I just enjoy the cast so much. It is such a banger cast of characters in this film that were not bona fide stars at the time, but have all since exploded in very crazy and fun ways. And their chemistry works so well. And I mean, you know, this is the first time Adam Sandler and Steve Buscemi worked together and they've done, you know, like 12 movies together at this point. So they've had a very fruitful career together. Uh, Sandler, I, I always love when Steve Buscemi gets with Sandler because that's when Steve Buscemi gets weird. I think he does it now more in, in other stuff, but originally that was where, where you got your dose of comedy Buscemi. Yes, very true. You make a good point. Sandler aside, there are a ton of people in this movie. And some of them were uh, so, sort of giants of their time. Uh, Michael McKeon, perfect casting. Absolutely oh my perfect God. casting. Yes. Works so well. Joe Montaigne as Ian the Shark is so, so perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Dustin, did you know that it's the 30th anniversary of this movie this year? I did not know that. I mean, I guess at some level I, I realized that this year ends in a four and that year ended in a four. But Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't put it together. August 5th, uh, 1994, the movie was released. Wowzers. That is crazy. It and it's and it's had a, a a heck of a ride over those years. It was I mean, it was a pretty big flop when it came out, right? Theatrically, it was a massive flop. It didn't really yeah. turn around until uh it, Comedy Central was playing it nonstop, which is where I first experienced the movie. Yeah, definitely. Same. Crazy to me that it was a flop on an $11 million budget. I can't imagine a movie with an $11 million budget these days. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. A movie like this, a Hollywood comedy. Yeah, uh, and an actual fairly, you know, big studio movie. So this film is about a rock band trying to make their way on the radio waves. There were no MP3s, no uh, Spotify, not even Napster yet. They just wanted to get some good old-fashioned airplay. And uh, what lengths do they go to, to to get that? They do the perfectly rational thing of seeing a rival band get successful by having their song played on a rock radio station called KPPX. And they decide to take the radio station hostage to have their song played on the air. And it's a rollicking good time. I mean, pretty quickly, every member of this uh, station crew develops uh, Stockholm Syndrome for these guys and helps them in various ways in furthering their career. Is that right? Yeah, so much so that even when they escape the radio station, they come back to try to get back inside the radio station because they were having so much fun. Okay, so the band. The band in the film, The Lone Rangers, that's the reason we're here to talk. Yes. It's about good old-fashioned rock and roll music. For Unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know. There, There is only the one song in the film right uh they get a lot of mileage out of it uh i think various parts of it are used well throughout you get and and it and it's one thing i love in this film is the way they hype it up you don't hear the song right away you know the demo the first demo is ruined uh the second demo well it's got it's got dog pee on it or something right yeah d- a dog pee the people have been kicking it uh there was a car that was bouncing on the cassette tape via hydraulics so it's just, it's all messed up, and and you know we're about two thirds or more of the way into the movie before we finally get to hear even a glimpse of it. Well, no, you, that's not true. Yeah, because because the glimpses come when it's being uh, destroyed. You get more glimpses of it when Kayla is driving her car when she throws the tape out. That's right. You don't that's you right. don't hear the song in its entirety until the very end of the movie. Okay. 
when they're shooting the music video into the prison, prison. scene. Yeah. Okay. Well, forget all that dumb shit I said then. <laughs> so, Sean, who are the members of the band, the Lone Rangers? The Lone Rangers consist of Chaz Darby. Chaz is played by the great Brendan Fraser. And then we have Rex, who is the bassist, and he's played by Steve Buscemi. And finally, we have Rex's brother, Pip, played by Adam Sandler, and he is the drummer of the band. He looks like a drummer. Somehow they styled him like a drummer and made him act like a drummer, and I, I can't put my finger on how that is, yeah. but, but it works. So are you aware of, is this movie, I mean, it's always had sort of a cult status bubbling under ever since the Comedy Central constant replays but like uh has this movie gotten any more popular now that brendan fraser's on his uh second arc i would assume i mean you know uh i think it was oh man i can't remember what youtube channel does those actors on actors uh interviews i think it's like vanity fair or something like that but they do this thing called actors on actors where they have two actors interview each other and they last year set up sandler and and brendan to do to interview each other and they did some airheads talking and and that was uh, really cool to see oh that's cool that's cool and i'm pretty sure when he was doing his uh award show push for the whale that uh howard stern talked to him about airheads a little bit as well because howard was a big fan of it I'm surprised stern wasn't in this film i'm sure i'm sure somebody talked to somebody about making it happen at some point yeah possibly i mean it's not above cameos. Dude, Lemmy is in this thing, and they even make Lemmy jokes. Uh, oh, Beavis sure. and Butthead are in this thing. You know, it's uh, it's not above cameos, that's for sure. The Beavis and Butthead thing was interesting. Uh, it felt felt weird. <laughs> uh, like, I, it just, uh, you know, you know, we know them so well now as the characters on the cartoon from MTV. Like, uh, I was just like, oh, they're just, they're not going to explain that. It's just Beavis and Butthead, like somewhere in this universe sure yeah uh speaking of weird stuff that behind the scenes video you sent me was so strange yeah it is strange but at the same time it's still pretty cool oh it's definitely cool it, it, it was just such a such a funny concept uh of having it's if, if you haven't seen it uh it's this newscaster interviewing people seemingly during the events of the film and then it gets really meta and, and they acknowledge that the filmmaker the actual director of the film is making a film in the universe of the people in the radio station as the hostage situation is unfolding it's a lot of layers a lot of layers but yeah it was a cool way to see you know people on set and see chris farley get ambushed with a mic and yeah turn on some improv a lot of people haven't seen that so seeing somebody of that caliber do something you've never seen before is pretty cool and i also really like the way that they interviewed michael richard's character inside of the air duct inside system. The vent, i thought that, yes. that was really funny yeah that was great i love that basically his entire story exists separately from everyone else's i wonder if he if he did just kind of shoot in a whole separate circumstance with like you know the vent system being somewhere else and at a totally different time but like michael richards my god like he could just he, he was the guy for sure if you need someone to be funny alone just everything every movement he makes is hilarious in this yeah his physical comedy is absolutely top tier in this film it's very very good now dustin do you know who the real members of the lone rangers are the real members, I know a little bit. I read a little bit. Uh, it seems like they are members of the band White Zombie. That is correct. They are members of the band White Zombie. But Fraser Fraser did do the vocals. He Yes, he absolutely did do the vocals. The breakdown goes like this. It's on guitar, Jay Younger. On bass, we have Sean Assault. And on drums, we have Phil Burstate with Brendan Fraser on vocals. So is this the entirety of White Zombie? I don't know enough about them. Is this the entirety of White Zombie minus Rob Zombie? That is correct. So how did those guys get involved? They did an original song for the soundtrack called Feed the Gods, which is the song that they're playing when Officer Wilson, Chris Farley's character, goes into the whiskey looking for Kayla. That's the song that they're playing, Feed the Gods. Originally, the director of the movie wanted Cannibal Corpse to be playing at the Whiskey Go-Go, but... They appeared in the first Ace Ventura movie as they are Jim Carrey's favorite band, so they made a pivot to White Zombie. Wow. Cannibal Corpse mm -hmm. was just too in demand. Yeah, in 1994, they were hot, baby. <laughs> Do you feel like the music in the film is pretty representative of the time? I kind of think 
it's uh, it's it's the classic Hollywood thing where it's a little bit behind. It's a year or two behind. We're, this is 1994. We're we're getting into grunge at this point. Well, and I feel like they're trying to do the metal, the hair metal thing a bit still. What do you? What's your take? I did not feel that this was a hair metal soundtrack or a hair metal vibe that they were going for personally i guess hair metal's wrong and and the soundtrack is kind of different even still than the music the band plays it seems a little bit like they're trying to make them fit any sort of subculture you might be into when you're watching this film uh like do you get what i'm saying like they're not they're not especially punk they're not especially metal they're not especially grunge like they're just kind of they're rockers you know well but I mean, that's a joke in the movie when Ian the Shark asks them what kind of music they play, and then they all three of them say a bunch of random shit, and then they end on Power Slop. That's true. <laughs> that's true. So there it is. They're a Power Slop band. I forgot. There, there's yeah. a definitive answer to the genre. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. I have some uh, some photographs for you to see here, Dustin. Oh, do you? It is from the recording of the song, Degenerated. Oh, show me, show me. It is of... Brendan, Adam, and Steve, along with the members of White Zombie. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And we're going to put these up on our Instagram page, so that way you guys can see them, too. So, who am I looking at in this shot of uh, White Zombie? Do you, you happen to know names? Absolutely, yeah. So, on the very left, you've got Sean Assault, and then you've got Buscemi, then you've got Rob Zombie, then you've got Brendan, Adam, Dave Burstate, and then finally, Jay Younger on the right hand side. Okay, so okay, so Rob was there. That answered one of my questions about like was this the sort of when the band started to f- separate from, or when he started to separate from the band as a solo act? Yeah, no, he was. Yeah, he was definitely there for the recording. In fact, he gave Brendan some uh, pointers on 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 how to sing. I found a little snippet of an interview where uh, Rob told him to do less, don't sing, and just belt it out. Good advice. Yeah. In any situation. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> uh, that's great. I what a what a weird thing that would have been to do at the time to be in a studio with every the entirety of white zombie singing a song by reagan youth for a movie that just might be your breakout thing yeah no kidding but you bring up an interesting point a lot of people do not realize that the song the lone rangers sing degenerated is a reagan youth cover it's a legitimate punk rock song oh yeah i don't know if you've done the lyrics side by side uh but there are i have there are some notable uh, substitutions, uh, just in the name of cleaning it up, I guess. But then also some weirder substitutions where I, I don't, I don't really know why they changed the words. Johnny don't care about this world as long as he can fuck his girl was a change to do his girl. So the, the all the intent is. <laughs> there they just took out the f word although there's one later i think they uh they they took out johnny wastes no no the eaten loot i just heard it wrong never mind yeah it almost scratch that it almost sounds like brendan saying eating lunch it does so okay it sounds like he's saying eating lunch yeah it does sound like he's saying eating lunch So that maybe that was a last minute edit, you know, at the at, at standards time, and they went, "Hey, eh, you can't say lewds. <laughs> you can talk about yeah. getting high in the next the <laughs> next verse or the next line in the verse, but uh, eating lewds. No, let's just can you just say lunch? Just say lunch. We'll cut it in. But I think that the cover song. I mean, not disparaging the original one because the original one goes really hard, but I think that the cover is a little bit more my speed with it just being more polished and tuned for radio play. Okay, I got you. I feel you there. Um, I, of course, disagree with you uh, because I I want it to I want it dirty and uh, as fair punk as possible. Uh, the thing that stuck out to me with the the Lone Rangers version, and, and this is kind of what led me to talk about how they span a bunch of different genres to try to appeal to everyone, uh, is is that guitar solo that they add in the beginning. Mm. felt very That felt very like hair metal style uh, of the early 90s. Um, 
and it, and it wasn't weird at all. It absolutely works with the song. It's only weird if I go back and listen to the the original punk rock recording and, and compare the two. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but I, I like both. As far as songs for movies go, this is a great route to go because they they have so much more legitimacy behind it because it was a real song first, but it pro- but it probably not one that most of the audience of this film had ever heard. And for anybody who did know it, it's just cool. Oh, there's a Reagan Youth song in this. Like that's pretty legit. They they talk about some legit stuff. This this might not be some, you know, square Hollywood film. That's true. So Dustin, the Lone Rangers are not the only band in this movie. They're not. We can't forget about our little buddies the Sons of Thunder, the band that are getting all the attention that the Lone Rangers are so desperately seeking. Right. They're like the big, bad, sellout, uh, watered down, everything, everything a real, real music guys hate, right? Oh, God, they hate it. They have a debut album coming out called Scrambled Eggs and Wobbly Legs, and their <laughs> featured single is Don't Hate Me, parentheses, because I'm beautiful, end parentheses. That Wobbly Legs one, that's a Jack Johnson song or some shit. Oh, yeah. Well, that's how he starts every day with scrambled eggs and wobbly legs. <laughs> Not unlike Frasier, uh, he, he gets rid of the wobbly eggs and throws a tossed salad in there. That's true. Yeah, yeah. You got to have the tossed <laughs> salad in there. Dustin, let's hear a little bit of this Sons of Thunder song since we yeah, only yeah, got yeah. like six seconds of it in the movie. Look at them stupid pantaloons they're wearing. That's what we got to do. Well, it looks like they're carrying a load in them pants. You know, they play this song on the radio and they got an album and everything. That's what we got to do. Your lips are broke. Your head is empty. This faded valentine is what you sent me. So, yeah, th- Sons of Thunder are, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. They're Bon Jovi. Oh, my God. They t- that is so Bon Jovi. I didn't even think about that. I mean, you know, I it definitely, yeah, when I when I saw it in the movie, I was like, so they're like, the that's the hair metal that's on its way out or whatever. But I think specifically they, they went for a very Jovi-esque vocal call out there. <laughs> so that's an actual real heavy metal band. They're called Galactic Cowboys. Okay. They were instructed for that song to purposefully write a terrible song. Oh, that's great. I mean, I, well, then maybe they're the ones who were... Who are really going for the dagger there but doesn't sound <laughs> unlike popular music of the time or at least of a few years prior yeah i think that one is a little bit more of the hair metal stuff that you were talking about more so than the lone rangers yeah i think you're right i think you're right I, my confusion was they're just not fully grunge which is what i what you would expect to be the thing like that's what literally happened you know hair metal got pushed out grunge was on the way in if you weren't wearing flannel and upset about having to be alive you didn't know what was going on in music after a little bit of digging i was able to find out that the galactic cowboys recorded a full version of this song though it has never been released we only have that like 15 second snippet and it's so frustrating that we don't have the full song that is upsetting and i'm amazed that it hasn't come out over the years, it, it must be lost. Speaking of that, right? So I went on to the Lost Media wiki forums and I found a person that posted on there claiming to have talked to Monty, the bassist for Galactic Cowboys, and has presented them with an idea to re-record the song and then release it now, like Taylor Swift style. Oh, wow. Do, would they still know it? I, I, like, I guess it depends if... They recorded a demo and then brought it to the studio and then did the final one, in which case, yes, they should be able to do it because you would have the thing to listen to for you to replicate. Oh, sure. Yeah. If there's if there's any media still existing of it, I mean, fuck, show me the demo. Play me the demo. I would I would listen. You know, I want to hear that, too. Yeah. No matter what. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to hear this full version of the song, you know? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like uh, I'm sure it was great. I'm sure it was a great song, you know. It just wasn't their style. But I am fascinated by the fact that they recorded a full song, but it's never been released. There's no better time than the 30th anniversary of this movie to finally, to finally put out the soundtrack on vinyl. I have been asking for this for so long and not just put the soundtrack out on vinyl. I want the full 
soundtrack because if you buy the CD, it does not have all the songs on it. It's leaving out my favorite song outside of the Lone Ranger song. It's leaving out my favorite song on the soundtrack by Primal Scream. It's called Rocks. And I, I'm so mad that it's not on the CD. It needs to be oh, man. on the vinyl when they put that out, because I love that song. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. There are a lot of songs in this movie that are not on the official soundtrack. I'm sure that was just politics and negotiations of the time. Who gets who gets the spot where? Sure. But there's a lot of cool music in this. I think the director was a, was a pretty big music guy, uh, from what I've read. Uh, I've also read that he wanted to make a really killer soundtrack for this movie. And I think he succeeded in it because when you're watching it, you're just like jamming out with all of the songs that are going on. And Four Non Blondes cover of I'm the One by Van Halen is so sick. I listen to that version of the song more than I listen to the Van Halen version, honestly. <laughs> That's fantastic. It is a killer soundtrack, though, man. We got Motorhead on that thing, White Zombie, Primal Scream. We got... Four Non Blondes, all kinds of really good, awesome stuff on this soundtrack. Super cool stuff. And I think this is the kind of thing that happens or especially happened back then. You know, you get talking to director talks to somebody who knows somebody and pretty soon White Zombie's in and oh, they know Lemmy and Motorhead's in. Lemmy's in the film. Getting Lemmy in the film is uh, is an interesting thing because they had the Lemmy joke already in the script. So, But the director was like, oh, do you think Lemmy would, would do a cameo for it? And then he came he just hung out all night with the extras and just was a cool dude from uh, the account oh, of the wow. director. Is that the story? That's great. I did wonder why they had the, the Lemmy is God joke. And then it, pretty quickly after, oh, there he, there he is. Yeah, he was editor of the school magazine. <laughs> so, Dustin, are you aware that there are more bands in this movie that don't exist in real life? I was not aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, there's two more. Two more. What are the other two? <laughs> so in the movie, when they start taking calls from outside, they take two phone calls. The second one is from Beavis and Butthead. The first one is from a man who asks for tickets to the Orange County Invasion show to see Penelope Lovestalking and Crimson Shroud. Both of those <laughs> bands are fake, but Crimson Shroud became a video game for the Nintendo 3DS in 2012, which I find very funny. No kidding. Yeah. Related or just, j no, just the just same two words? Yeah, it's just happenstance. What are the odds of Crimson Shroud? That's not a common... <laughs> is it a common phrase? I have no idea. I just started... I googled Crimson Shroud, and the first thing that came up with this damn video game, and I just started laughing. Crimson Shroud is a role-playing video game. So these two bands, right? This is going back to the, to the grunge stuff that you keep bringing up. Chaz calls both of them Seattle bullshit. That's right. They do reference the Seattle bullshit. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so they really are trying to carve out a place in between the Bon Jovi and fake metal and the... Seattle bullshit, as they call it. I didn't realize that those two bands were fake. I never looked into that before. Yeah, they didn't stand out to me as, as being real or fake, I guess. <laughs> but it makes sense that they would they would make them up. So, Dustin, I've got a couple of uh, fun movie facts for uh, Airheads. Oh, I love fun facts. What you got? KPPX, the radio station in the movie, is based on a real Southern California radio station. It was known as K-N-A-C 105.5 in Long Beach. Is this like a, it was a real rock station that flipped formats? Yeah, K-N-A-C 105.5. They uh, stopped in 1995, so a year after the movie. So it was pretty topical for, for the time that it was happening. You know, it, they lasted longer than the movie did. Oh, interesting. I mean, I don't know for a fact that this is the inspiration for it. But uh, in my digging, I found pretty substantial evidence. So I'm going to send you a photograph of a t-shirt and, we and we're going to put this on, on the Instagram as well. Okay. It's a KNAC uh, t-shirt, vintage one. I found a picture of this online and it features a line that Ian the Shark says in the movie, if it's too loud, you're, you're too, too old. old. And that was their slogan. Oh, wow. So it's... That's a direct reference uh -huh. to real life. That's when I was like, oh, okay, now I believe it. 
now I believe that that's the inspiration for Airheads. Yeah, that that that's that sells it. That settles it for me. Uh, if it's too loud, you're too old. Uh, it's a cool shirt. There's like a zombie Willie Nelson kind of looking guy on the front. The second fun movie fact that I have is that throughout the entire movie, anytime they're outside, you can see Nakatomi Plaza from Die Hard in the background. Aha, uh-huh, yes. I've heard about this. Wasn't the I, I thought the radio station was in Nakatomi Plaza or something. I guess I read that wrong. It's really Fox Plaza. It's in Beverly Hills mm-hmm. out here in Los Angeles. And it's a, it's a little turnaround. So you drive up this tiny little driveway. And then you when you get to the top of the driveway, your front of your car is facing KPPX. And then you do the little turnaround. You can see it in, in Die Hard, too. When the, co- when the cop shows up, it, it's like the aerial shot of the, of the car. In sure. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Super familiar with that. Yes. They do not like you to go up there and take photographs. I can imagine. <laughs> which, I, which I've done. I used to do this thing called uh, location hunting where I would go to places, uh, famous filming locations for movies and TV shows, and I would take comparison shots of how it looks now compared to how it looked when they shot the movie. I'll put all of those up on the, on the Instagram as well so that way you can see what everything looked like in 2019. But they were super pissed when I went up into that circle drive and started taking uh, photographs. It was the second time I got in trouble for trespassing. Oh, wow. Escorted off, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the second I pulled out the phone and started snapping off the pictures, I had somebody running up to me like, Hey! Hey, you can't take the pictures! Put that phone away! (laughs) And I just kept taking the pictures and just taking the pictures and finally just walked backward like, No, 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 we're good, we're good, we're good. (laughs) If only only you could have paid for the privilege like so many other films have. Yeah, well, you know, mine was way cheaper, so I think I'm good with it. (laughs) I'll take being chased over paying millions of dollars to use your turn around to take photographs well those are some good fun facts so dustin it looks like we're coming to the end of the episode here and uh i just got one final question for you and that's if the lone rangers were in our world how successful would they have been would you have listened to them what do you think their outcome would have been we get a little bit of information at the end of the movie it lets us know that their debut album live in prison went triple platinum which means it sold three million copies and that's pretty successful that's uh i mean that's really good for a live album to be honest certainly for a live album so would i be into them yeah i think i would i think they are uh i think they would have been just my speed especially at the time uh well not at the time if i was young at that time not a child right but uh yeah 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 i think they uh whether they want it whether they Called it that or not, they embodied a punk rock spirit for sure. I mean, very few things are more punk rock than taking a radio station hostage to get your demo. It's pretty played. nihilistic behavior. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the simple fact that they took over a radio station that was in a giant market like Los Angeles opens it up to the possibility of Kurt Loder from MTV showing up and being there live on the scene. Whereas had they done that in Toledo, Ohio... No MTV. Doubt they're getting nationwide coverage in 1994 yeah, for it. It's, it just looks more like a crime. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was, uh, it was the perfect snowball rolling down the hill in terms of location and what they were doing. Yeah, I wonder if, I wonder if there were fears at the time of anyone actually trying this uh, after the movie came out. Yeah, no kidding, right? It was pretty edgy. And they got in pretty easy, all things considered. Yeah, and, I, you know, security has improved obviously uh in in many ways but you know nothing beats pretending like you're supposed to be there it's the classic well they already had the look you know it's not uncommon for a band to be at a radio station oh sure yeah and they did look like a band so even ian the shark was like really calm when they entered the studio (laughs) like he was not threatened at all just started talking to them alive on the air Listen, Ian the Shark has been in this biz for a long time, and he's seen some crazy shit. <laughs> yeah, he's grizzled. <laughs> only, only somebody that's been in the business for so long can drink a beer and Pepto Bismol at the same time. <laughs> that was a good, uh, a good portrayal of like an industry guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He knows the band fucking sucks so bad, and he still has to be there. Just doesn't want to. I love this movie. I think that they would have been. A pretty big success off of that first record, and uh, and it would have carried over to the second one. I don't know that the second one would have been as successful, but it certainly would have been pretty successful still, and they would have had a, a, a good run. They probably would have gotten through at least three albums before people got over the 
the hostage situation tidal wave. Yeah, I mean they they could have they could have written that for a while. It really comes down to uh, whether whether Chaz would end up being the lyricist that he uh, started out as with the with the with the Reagan Youth lyrics. <laughs> And I and I certainly would have listened to them because this song is always in my top fifteen most played songs of the year. No so kidding. I, I I I listen to this song all the time. So let me ask you this one last question as we go. What would Ian the Shark have to say if he were sitting here in the booth with us right now? Oh, Ian the Shark. I think that he would say something like, Listen up, guppies. It's Sean and Dustin from K Flix Fiction Radio, and have we got a surprise for you? I've got goosebumps, frankly. For the first time ever, I'm willing to bet. Here's the hit single from The Lone Rangers. I mean, it is a groove, man. Oh, yeah. I fucking love. Like when that, when the fucking thing hits right there, wow, <laughs> fucking, oh my god, dude! And that's like such a good fucking point in the movie too, when he just flings the guitar to his side and yeah. arms out like Jesus. Uh-huh. Fuck, so good. <laughs> Fiction Radio.